Welcome back everybody, my name is Tucker and today I'm gonna to be looking back at the top 100 NBA draft rankings on nbadraft.net all the way back to 2009 and just reacting to and seeing how those rankings shape up compared to the league today. So let's just go ahead and jump into it starting with 2009 like I said the only reason that I'm starting with this year is because it's the first year that they have on their website so this is the Blake Griffin James Harden Steph Curry draft year and the way this went was Blake went number one Hashim the beat went two, James Harden went three and then later on we obviously got Steph and at first glance a lot of these are pretty defensible Blake was the pretty clear-cut unanimous best player in the draft class having James Harden at two makes sense and then in hindsight Putting Hashim the beat all the way down at six is probably one of the lower rankings you're going to find. And even though he ended up going second, he didn't really do anything in the league at all. Steph obviously down at seven. That's probably actually pretty high for where a lot of people had him at the time. And he was one of the more difficult prospects to figure out in this draft class. Some not so great ones. Jordan Hill at four. He ended up going to the Knicks, the pick immediately after Steph Curry. And he was solid, but didn't really bring a ton of skill to the table, was more just a, an energy guy and a hustle guy. Having Byron Mullins in the top 10 ahead of guys like Jeff Teague, who was an all-star, Tyreek Evans, who was the rookie of the year for this class because Blake Griffin got hurt and didn't play in his first year. And when you look at it, there's actually a lot of really good players throughout the class from top to bottom in 2009. So having Byron Mullins as the ninth best player in the entire class is uh, it's not ideal. The other questionable one to me in the top 10 is having Ricky Rubio and Brandon Jennings ahead of DeMar DeRozan. DeRozan obviously went on to become an all-star and Jennings started his career really well, suffered some injuries, was never really the same player. And it's kind of a similar story for Rubio. He's a good player in the NBA right now, uh, but not the third best player in this class. So having him ranked that high isn't great. Again, he had some injury issues in the beginning of his career that kind of slowed him down. And that, that's a defensible pick at the time. And nobody would have blamed you for having him that high at the time. But obviously, in hindsight, it, it did not work out. Up and down the draft class, though, like I said, I mean, Jeff Teague's really good. Tyreek Evans, Dewan Blair had some moments. And when you look at the rankings, like I said, with the exception of having Byron Mullins in the top 10 and having Rubio and Jennings ahead of DeRozan, as well as the beat ahead of Steph Curry, most of these are actually pretty solid. Moving on now to 2010, this is the John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, Evan Turner, Derek Favors, all kinds of different guys, Paul George, Gordon Hayward, all those guys were a part of this 2010 class. And straight off the bat, John Wall was the consensus first overall pick in this class. Evan Turner was a pretty consensus too. Having them ranked one and two was the norm leading up to this class. And that top four is actually exactly the way the draft ended up going. It went Wall, Turner, Favors, and then Wes Johnson. Beyond that, I can't remember Greg Monroe might have gone five. And you can see, obviously, there's a lot of Kentucky guys at the top. And the weird one to me is having Patrick Patterson ranked ahead of DeMarcus Cousins at the time of this draft. That Kentucky team was a little bit weird. Patterson was kind of the elder statesman of that group that was filled with so much freshman talent. But I don't really understand how you could have watched that season at Kentucky and thought that Patrick Patterson was going to be a better NBA player than DeMarcus Cousins. Because really, for Cousins at the time he was drafted, the question wasn't really his ability. People were just concerned about his attitude issues. And that's why he went where he did but for the most part that top 10 is pretty solid Greg Monroe was good for a while just completely fell off once big started to get a little bit more athletic the other big one is having Luke Babbitt and Al Farouk Aminu more so Babbitt than Aminu Aminu is actually a pretty solid player Babbitt is barely an NBA player he's been hanging on to the back end of a roster basically since he got into the league and having both of those guys on the wing ranked ahead of not only Paul George, but also Gordon Hayward in these rankings. If you wanna extend it further down than that, you can include Xavier Henry on that list as well, another guy that really didn't do anything in the league. And as we go through this, I feel like that's gonna end up being the toughest thing, is not just having overall rankings and, and having someone like Greg Monroe ranked ahead of Paul George. I mean, that's not great, but it's a little bit more defensible than ranking someone that is at the exact same position directly ahead of a player when the first guy turned out to be a bust and the other guy in Paul George's case turned out to be an all-NBA and all-star caliber player and Gordon Hayward obviously was an all-star as well. The other thing that catches my eye in this top 15 is having Hassan Whiteside out of Marshall all the way up at 14th. The reason that's surprising is because Hassan Whiteside was a really weird college story. He was being recruited by SEC schools, for some reason decided to go to Marshall, had a really good freshman year, left, 
went to the Kings, I believe with the 33rd pick. He was either a late first or an early second. And basically he completely flamed out of the league. He barely got any run. He had a really tough start to his career. Not a great circumstance to be in. And it was only later on when he was picked up by the Heat that he really started to do things. So having him ranked all the way in the top 15, it first probably didn't look very good for this guy immediately after the draft, but having him that high to me is pretty unforeseen. The way I remember this draft class, I don't remember Hassan Whiteside being ranked that high by very many people. Again, for most people, he was a late first round guy. The other interesting one we're looking at the top 20 is FK Udo, who this guy has ranked 17th. You can see he dropped him down eight spots, apparently right before the draft. And this was actually a pick by the Golden State Warriors immediately after they drafted Steph Curry. Because we want to give the Warriors all these props for drafting great players and that being the jump start to their dynasty, guys like Draymond, Clay, and Steph. And that's true. But FK Udo was, I believe, a top five pick. He was certainly a top 10 pick, and he barely did anything in the league for the Warriors or in general, really. So this is definitely an interesting group. And again, the top 10, the only thing I would really blame this guy for is having Patrick Patterson ranked immediately ahead of his college teammate, DeMarcus Cousins, and then putting Luke Babbitt and Alfred Aminu ahead of both Paul George, as well as Gordon Hayward. And you can put Xavier Henry on that list as well as it relates to Hayward. Next up, we have 2011, and this is certainly the least defensible ranking that we've looked at so far because he has Derek Williams ranked as his number one player in the 2011 class, and he had Ennis Cantor even ranked ahead of the eventual number one pick, Kyrie Irving. Now, I will say that at the time of the draft, Derek Williams, even though his career did not go well at all, and he's been on four or five different teams already, and I'm pretty sure he's out of the league right now, he was very clearly, by a pretty big consensus, the second best player in this class leading up to the draft. And the big knock on Kyrie was the fact that he really didn't play that many games in college, even though he was clearly very good. So having him ranked one at the time probably wasn't seen as a huge deal, but obviously now in hindsight, it doesn't look great. And having Ennis Cantor ranked ahead of Kyrie as well is something that I did not anticipate seeing in this draft class. I will say, however, I've made a video about the 2011 class before, and this was just a really weird group, but turned out to be an outstanding class, especially in terms of depth from top to bottom. I mean, if you look at the top 10, Kyrie is obviously great. Ennis Cantor's a solid player. Derek Williams flamed out, but we've already talked about him. Brandon Knight has been really good in the league when he's healthy, he just hasn't been healthy in what seems like four years. Jonas Valanciunas is really good. Clay Thompson's really good. Kemba, Kawhi, the Morris twins, Tobias Harris. I could keep going on and on and on. And so even though you have some complete misses, like having Monty Yunus in the top five, having Jan Vesely in the top six, putting Jimmer Fredette at eight, even though there are definitely some big misses like those guys, this draft class in particular, probably more than any other one that we're going to look at in this video, completely threw so many people off. You can see just in how much movement this guy has from one ranking to the next, this obviously being his final ranking, how difficult it was to judge this class. And it seems like every two or three players on this list, you see a name that's either a good player or was a good player at some point in their career. I already talked about that whole top 15, but as you move further down, Kenneth Reed has had some good moments. This Mac Biombo was good for the Raptors. Nikola Vucevic has been playing out of his mind. Norris Cole was really good for the Heat. Reggie Jackson's good. Chandler Parsons, injury issues aside, good player. Amon Shumpert, Bogdanovich, Jimmy Butler. And the big one that isn't even in this top 100 ranking anywhere is Isaiah Thomas. This guy made an all NBA second team and was not even in the top 100 ranking of this draft class. So again, even though there are plenty of mistakes within the top 10, the top 15, and throughout the entire rankings, one, I'm not expecting these things to be perfect. And two, this draft class threw off basically everybody. And the big thing I would knock this guy for is having Kyrie Irving as his third best player in the class. But again, this was just a weird one to figure out. Moving on now to the 2012 class, this is basically the Anthony Davis class. It became very clear throughout the college season that Anthony Davis was the best player in college. And then number two actually ended up being his teammate, Michael Kidd Gilchrist. Here, Kidd Gilchrist is ranked at eight, and that's pretty low from what I can remember leading up to this class. A lot of people were on board with him being a top two or top three pick. So having him ranked at eight is, is significant. Andre Drummond's at two. There was a lot of Andre Drummond hype this year. And yeah, this is just another really, really weird class the more that you look at it. Like you expect a little bit of variance, right? You expect that not everybody in the top 10 is gonna be a great player. Not everybody in the top 20 is gonna be a rotation player. And you're going to miss on some guys and some people later on are going to be better than you think. But even with that expectation, these are some very strange classes. 
Damian Lillard's at seven, ranked behind Jeremy Lamb as well as Thomas Robinson. Robinson's done very, very little in the league, and Lamb only really figured it out once he came to Charlotte, and he's basically just a high-level rotation player. Wow, he had Deion Waiters ranked 17th. I don't know what other people had Deion Waiters ranked at, but I know that he was a top five pick for the Cavs and it was a little bit of a surprise. I mean, maybe that was the norm at the time. I don't know, but that's that's a significant gap between where he was drafted and where this guy had him ranked. So the big misses are having Thomas Robinson in the top six, not having Dame higher than seven. And even though Andre Drummond's good, I don't know if he has enough of an impact to warrant being the second best player in the draft class. But more than anything, as I'm going through this, I'm realizing how weird NBA draft class rankings can be when you look at them from this perspective, five or six or seven or eight years down the road. Next up is 2013. And this obviously is a very weird class. We all remember this as the Anthony Bennett class. And it might seem strange to see Ben McLemore and Cody Zeller's names ranked one and two, but at the time, that wasn't unheard of. Coming out of Kansas, a lot of people really liked Ben McLemore's game. They thought he was gonna be a really good pro. There was some Ray Allen comparisons around and people just thought that he was a little bit immature. And if he got that figured out, he would have the talent to be an all-star level guard. And Cody Zeller was thought to be one of the best players in college, both as a freshman and as a sophomore, which is when he left school. So having him that high was not unheard of either. Look at that top four though. CJ McCollum, obviously the best of the group in that top four. Then you've got Alex Lynn, Cody Zeller, and Ben McLemore. Victor Oladipo, Nerlens Noel at five and six. Having Alex Lynn ranked ahead of Nerlens Noel is a head scratcher to me at the time of the draft. Obviously, Noel kickstarted the process by being drafted by the Sixers in a trade for Drew Holiday. But more than anything, this is just another strange class. At 14 is Michael Carter Williams. He was the rookie of the year. And then Giannis at 15. Further down is Rudy Gobert, ranked as the 30th best player in this draft class. Robert Covington's down there. That's some pretty good depth, but more than anything, like <laughs> this is just not a very good draft class at the top. Nobody was gonna pick Giannis in the top 10. Nobody was gonna pick Rudy Gobert in the top 10. Victor Oladipo was always gonna go pretty high, but even he didn't blossom until he got to Indiana. It took him two different teams to find his spot, find his place in the league, become an all-star level player. And this is one of those rare draft classes where it was better to have a later pick in the first round in between the top 10, the top 15, even later in the first round than it was to be picking from any of these guys at the top with the exception of Oladipo. And the crazy thing is too, like you would look at this and think, man, what is this guy thinking? These are awful rankings. At the time, these are perfectly defensible. Like this is not a weird, completely out there, completely going against the consensus kind of ranking for this draft class. It's just very, very difficult to predict these things. Moving on now to 2014 and 2015. And these are the last two that I'm really gonna spend a ton of time on because 16, 17, and 18, it's really difficult to judge them right now. I'm gonna look through them really quickly, but these last two are really the ones I'm gonna spend more time on. So first up, we do actually have Joel Embiid, and that's interesting just because leading up to the draft, it was pretty much, do you want Jabari or do you want Andrew Wiggins? And it was pretty clear that Embiid was not in the conversation for the first or second pick simply because of injury issues. Some of the bigger misses in the top 10 include Dante Exum, although he does still have some potential and could do some things in the league. Someone like Noah Vonley, Alfred Payton, Doug McDermott. But again, not the strongest draft class, at least in terms of guys at the top, because we can look in hindsight and say, oh, this player went 30th and he was the best player in the class or one of the best players in the class. I'm pretty sure Jokic is in this one, but you also have to understand that at the time, nobody was taking Nikola Jokic in the top 10 or the top 20. Moving on now, we have the 2015 draft, and this one is actually a lot different than I thought it would be because at the time of the draft, it was, are you Carl Anthony Towns or are you Jaleel Okafor? Those are the two teams that people were on for the number one overall pick. Now, leading up to the draft, it became more and more clear that the versatility of Towns and his ability to score from different areas of the court compared to Okafor's very post-heavy game, ended up working out in Towns' favor, and he obviously got picked first overall, and he's ranked first overall here. Having Emmanuel Moutier ranked second is iffy, even for the time of the draft, because there was some hype around him. He went overseas as opposed to going to college, took a bit of a different route, only played in a handful of games over there, but he was seen as a big guard that could really do some things in terms of attacking the rim, playmaking and kind of a poor man's John Wall was a lot of the comparisons that I heard leading up to this class, but having him rank second, the way I remember it at least was not the norm. But for a lot of these guys, it's still really, really early in their careers and it's too difficult or, or too early to say automatically that this guy should have gone here, this was a mistake. Yes, there are some people you could automatically say 
should have been higher. Devin Booker should have been higher. Cameron Payne should have been lower. But for the time that these were put out, none of these really surprised me except for having Okafor all the way down at four and having Moutier up at two. And now, like I said, I'm really not gonna talk too much about 2016, 17, or 18 just because it is still so early. But at first glance, the big ones for me are having Marquise Chris and Dragon Bender at six and seven. People had them in the top 10, it made sense. The Suns picked both of them. It hasn't worked out for either of them. So at the time it was defensible, but looking back on it, obviously having them that high was not great. The other big one is Furkan Korkmaz, who I believe was picked outside the lottery. I wanna say he was picked in the 20s by the Sixers. So having him ranked all the way at nine ahead of guys like Jamal Murray, DeJounte Murray, Karis LeVert, any of those guys, having Korkmaz ahead of them is questionable. And then moving down, again, some of these guys might turn into solid rotation players, but for now, it's a little bit early to be painting any of them in any kind of real life with the exception of the top of the class. This was a pretty consensus thing, having Simmons and Ingram at one and two. And then the closer you got to the draft, Jalen Brown became the clear choice at three as well. 2017, and I know I said I wasn't gonna talk about this one too much, but now that I see it, having Josh Jackson ranked as the number one player in the 2017 class would be seen as very much not the norm. For all the issues that Markel Fultz has had, he was clearly the top pick in the draft at the time. If things had gone well for him, if things had gone according to plan, I don't know what happened with his shoulder. I don't know what happened in his head, but if things had gone the way that they were supposed to, everybody was sure that Markel Fultz was gonna be the best player in this class. Having Josh Jackson ranked ahead of him makes very little, if any sense. He is just another player in the line of Kansas wings that has not worked out in the NBA, despite being drafted very high and being ranked very high. The other two coming to mind here being Andrew Wiggins and Ben McLemore. This is made even worse by the fact that he has Jason Tatum ranked all the way down at seven. Unfortunately, there's no rationale here for why he thought Josh Jackson should be as high as this. And to me personally, I highly doubt he's even in the Suns long-term plans at this point. Maybe you'll prove me wrong. Maybe Josh Jackson will turn it around with the Suns or with a different team. I just don't see it though. He doesn't seem to have very much confidence. He doesn't seem to have very much NBA level skill. And at this point, he's probably on his way out of the league within the next three years. And there you have it. That is going to be the end of today's video. Once again, this was me going over all the top 100 rankings on NBA draft.net for every single draft class in the NBA since 2009. I know this was a little bit different, but again, I'm going to be trying new things over the next couple of weeks and I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any other ideas similar to this that you would like me to try out, reacting to these kinds of things, maybe some draft evaluations, things like that, hit me up on Twitter. Let me know in the comment section. Either way, I'm always up for suggestions. But with all that said, once again, my name is Sucker. If you missed any of my previous videos, then be sure to check out the boxes on screen. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time.